Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody today to uh, today's AT3 webinar, Captioning Video Meetings and Trainings. And I'm Marty Exline with AT3, and we're very happy to have our presenters with us today for today's session, Laura Plummer from the Wisconsin AT program, WISTEC, and John Brandt from the main AT program, main site. And I want to thank everybody for re-registering for the webinar today. Um, as I mentioned in the AT3 list, um, we revised some of our security settings, which required everybody to, to register again. So really, really appreciate you guys going to that extra effort. Um, I know that the earlier postings said that you would only have to register once for all of the COVID-19 AT3 webinars, but with the new settings, you will have to register for each of the uh, individual webinars. And so we'll be sending out um, registration links for, for each one of the uh, webinars. Um, there won't be a COVID webinar next Thursday. Instead, we'll be having our uh, affinity group calls um, at that same time. At the same time, uh, you should have received an email from Amy on Monday, and we'll be sending out a message tomorrow with a specific call-in numbers um, and more information for the state agency groups, the university groups, and the nonprofit group. And so the next COVID-19 uh, webinar from AT3 is scheduled for Thursday, May 7th. And again, you'll be receiving a registration link for that um, as, it's, uh, as it's available. Um, from some of our previous webinars, um, this topic, captioning video meetings and trainings, was one that was mentioned several times and that we've had some requests on as an area that people wanted more information on. So um, we appreciate uh, Laura and John being here to talk about the different types of captioning, certainly the importance of making a accurate captioning available and how to and when to provide it. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, closed captioning is available um, just down at the uh, closed caption icon at the bottom of your screen. The webinar is being recorded and should be available um, early next week. So um, we will send on posting to let everybody know when it's available um, for folks that may have had trouble uh, registering. So with that, um, and we will, um, if you have any questions or comments, just go ahead and post them in the chat box and we'll stop periodically and um, pose those um, to the presenters. And with that, um, I think I'll just go ahead and turn it over to you, John. Or Laura was going to go first. I'm sorry. Yeah, Laura. Okay, great. Um, so welcome everyone, and thank you, Marty and John, for letting me uh, join you in this uh, session. So if you want, Kim, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the first slide for me. So um, our title slide today essentially says providing access, and um, both John and I wanted to offer up a disclaimer. Um, on uh, to share that meeting and webinar platforms vary. So we have a long choice nowadays um, to choose from. The settings and options for each of those platforms is varies and they, the programs and platforms, they are routinely updated and modified. And so what is shared today, um, there is possibility it might be outdated by tomorrow. So that is our disclaimer. Um, so we're speaking to you today from what we know today. So next slide, please. All right, so I just start, we're gonna start with a few definitions today. So when we talk about captioning, what we're really talking about is speech to text. And so this is an umbrella term, and it's really just taking spoken word and somehow converting it into a text-based format. So just wanted to lay down that groundwork of speech to text. And then we'll talk about the various options on that next slide. So Kim, if you don't mind, thanks. So um, some definitions for today's um, information is, the first one is CART. And so realizing that that stands for communication access real-time translation. CART is performed by a trained and qualified court reporter using specialized equipment. And CART is a verbatim transcript. So if I say um 25 times in a paragraph, 
that's what's going to come across. So it is word for word translation of spoken word to text. Our next level that we can provide is text translation. And this is commonly, um, two common ones are cprint and type well. And please ignore the typo that's in this slide, it will be fixed. Um, but these are certain programs and software that folks are trained to use. And essentially the purpose of this is, is to convey meaning. And so it's not a word for word, but it's a meaning for meaning from the spoken word to the text base. And then our third level that we'll talk about or that may come up today is our automatic or AI. And so this is our auto-generated speech to text. It's what we're seeing on in PowerPoint. It's what we're seeing in Google Slides. It's what many of us use on our smartphones. And so it's taking that spoken word and the computer is generating it into that text-based format. So those are our three different levels um, or options when we talk about speech to text, especially for webinars. So the next slide. So on the screen are two examples and on the left hand side would be an example of what cart is. This is our nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb and its fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. And so we can continue reading on that. But again, it is word for word what is being spoken and what is then translated into text. When we talk about text translation, that's the column on the right. So Mary had a lamb with white fleece. The lamb followed Mary everywhere. So as you can tell, it's conveying that meaning, but it's not word for word. So the next set of slides, okay, we'll, we'll hang here for a minute. So the next question that usually comes up, well, meaning, meaning and conveying that meaning is good, is good enough, enough. And so I hear that question quite a bit is good, you know, well, the captions are close, that's good enough. So I would challenge folks right now on the screen is a, a um, image of a puzzle piece and there is a story on that puzzle piece and pieces of that puzzle are missing. And this is um, published by Karen Anderson, who is a top notch um, educator for students who are deaf, hard of hearing. And so on this screen, people are encouraged to try to see if they can read what is being said, even with all those puzzle pieces missing. So this is what 75% of content might be appear to be, um, or how much you would get out of 75%. So we'll go to the next slide. So we're getting a little better. We're at 85%. There's a fewer pieces are missed and we can actually read some more of the words. We can start to kind of maybe gather what the content it means. We go one more down. So we're not 90. And that's pretty close. Most of us would tend to think 90 is good, but you're still missing a couple pieces of information in this story in order to really understand what's being conveyed. So we'll go ahead to the last one. And here's 100%. It read, Fran had a sore throat. She loved to jump on lily pads. Twilight and morning were the best time for her to eat. It made her happy to eat big juicy flies, but it hurt Fran to croak. So number one, this is a pretty jumbled up story. And number two, it's not any story that we might know. So we don't know the context of what this story is about. So having those, having less than 100% really meant that it was gonna be very hard for us to understand what this story says. So that's kind of the basis for today. And then um, we'll go ahead and let John take over. That was quick. Hi, I'm not going to use my video because I end up watching myself and playing with my my beard when I do that. So um, if we can move to the next slide. <laughs> so we have a couple of caveats for uh, for those in the audience today. Um, and I think uh, Laura alluded to this in the beginning. Uh, accessibility, I like to say, is a moving target. Things are constantly changing. The technologies that we use are changing. Uh, actually, people are changing. Um, sometimes their needs are changing. So it makes um, it makes this a very interesting topic to talk about because, as we said earlier, we can talk about the way things are right now, but you know, five minutes from now they may be different. 
Um, I sort of see the train of uh, technology in general moving along at a very rapid pace. It seems like it's getting faster and faster and accessibility is almost always behind there. Sometimes it catches up a little bit, but usually it's, it's pretty far behind. The second caveat is I'm not an expert um, and I, I don't want anybody to walk away here and say, uh, well, we heard so-and-so say, and he's an expert. Um, I do the best I can to try to keep up on the topic. And since there have been so many questions on the topic of captioning and uh, access to uh, digital media recently, I've been trying to read everything I can. Uh, I think I've attended three webinars in the last three weeks uh, on this whole topic of meeting at a distance. They uh, have presented information that's consistent with my experience, uh, but we all agree that we're not experts. The third thing is, what are the rules? And this is a bit of an interesting uh, conundrum. Um, there are really no specific rules that pertain to what we're doing right now. That is delivering live content uh, and captioning that live content uh, in this video conference media. There are rules that pertain to broadcast television and there are rules that pertain to web access for um, recorded or pre-recorded video, but there's nothing for that group in the middle. So what I've done is extrapolate the rules from broadcast television and the rules for, um, for, web, access, for web accessibility and kind of say, well, we'll apply those rules here with some, some variation. So it makes it for kind of, kind of an interesting conundrum. What we don't plan to talk about today is, you know, really any more than we've already said about what is captioning or how to really provide captioning, how to pay for it, how to hire somebody to do things for you. If you have those questions and you want to post those in the chat pod, we will try to address those at the end of the presentation. The, the plan is to um, make this as much of a dialogue as we can um, and leave plenty of time for questions. So, um, so if you have those specific questions, please go ahead and post those in the chat and we'll, um, and we'll deal with them as we can. Next slide, please. So this presentation, as it were, started as a conversation about two and a half weeks ago uh, with Marty and Amy and I, and we were talking about captioning and what could we do. And so I generated sort of five questions that uh, I've been getting on a pretty regular basis for the last five weeks. And so I thought this could be a sort of a way to start the conversation. And then uh, particularly when we get to question number four, which is what are the challenges, then open up the, uh, the conversation to everybody to contribute what they have found as challenges and perhaps solutions. And so that's where the dialogue would start. So the five questions that we're gonna deal with are one, live video versus post-production, should I care? Sort of define what those two things are. Secondly, talk about the automatic, gen automatically generated, AI generated caption versus CART or live transcription using a human being. What should I use? That's a big hot question. Three, what are the video conference platforms and which one should I use? Um, and then four, what are those biggest challenges in providing captioning? That's what we're going to sort of touch off into a conversation. And ultimately, where can I get more information about this topic? So let's go through these. The first slide. Next slide, please. So whoop, let me skip past it. There we go. So live versus post-production. Um, so post-production is a term that's used in the whole video world. It basically means you have the recording and now it's you know, been edited and now it's the time you can do things to it. Uh, live video obviously is what we're doing now. It's a live event and we have somebody who is a trained card captionist who's providing captioning as I'm speaking. But as Laura indicated earlier, um, we want to make sure that that, that, that that content is as accurate as possible. And that is very, very difficult to do in a live situation, no matter who you are. Um, there are many different things that come up that cause problems. And so um, the, uh, the problem with a live, uh, whether you're using CPrint or any of the other applications, is going to be accuracy. 
Now, I like to say that time is on your side, and because post-production helps you to iron out those, those problems, my recommendation, and this is my rule, not necessarily any law, um, the rule is that you should always record your presentations and then use the post-production process to fix those things that are incorrect. Um, we'll talk about some of the kind of common things that are um, areas that are of concern, but in post-production, you can take the time to edit it. You can either do it yourself or you can hire somebody to do that. If you can, it's always, you, always great to use a script. And I recommend this, uh, particularly if you're doing a really a formal presentation. Um, I mean, I did write out a lot of what I want to say today and I could read it to you, but um, I, I think it's you know, not necessarily needed at this particular point in time. Uh, if I were teaching a class, perhaps, and it was something that I wanted to make sure that the students got all the information, I might, in fact, do a script and write it out in complete sentences so it made sense. That's great because then you have that script afterwards that you can use as part of the captioning content to be able to fix things. It makes it much easier to do. Uh, so the important um, thing to walk away at this point is to realize that there are many, many challenges to captioning live meetings, um, even with all the, with everything working for you. Next slide, please. So this is probably the question of the hour. Uh, I had a meeting this morning with a group of people, and that was the question. I had a meeting yesterday, and that was the question. We hear all these things about these AI generated captions. Uh, aren't they just as good as CART? Do we have to hire a person? I can get this for free, um, you know, and all these different kinds of, of um, rationales. And so the question everybody wants to know, which is better? And so at this very second, at this moment in time, I can say um, without blinking that CART, that, that a human, a car transcription will be always better than any automatic automatic captioning service. The reason is um, the, the automatic captions will invariably make mistakes with people's names. They will make mistakes with vocabulary they're not familiar with. So if it's a name of a product or a service that's unique, it almost always will try to spell it out phonetically and it will not make any sense. Um, they inevitably have problems with things like URLs with a um, domain name. So you'll have uh, the one that's, that's our big bugaboo. Our, our organization has the domain name mainsite.org, spelled M-A-I-N-E-C-I-T-E, -E, obviously dot org. And whenever we say that in an automatic captioning thing, it always comes out M-A-I-N-S-I-T-E, D-O-T-O-R-G. So yeah, that's sort of phonetically correct, but obviously is in terms of meaning and understanding is not the right answer. So to some extent, um, uh, you need to know your audience and make an informed decision about whether to use automatic captioning or not. Just because it's cheaper or because it's available to you is not a good rationale. If you have people in your audience you know are going to be people with hearing impairments or deafness, you need to make sure that that content is as clear and accurate as possible. Um, so don't cut corners just because you, you, know, you can save money. Uh, as Laura indicated with those nice uh, graphics at the beginning, even something like 90% is often um, not high enough quality for it to be useful to a person who is relying upon captioning to understand something. By the way, a little something that I'm aware of that I'm gonna put as a note, um, and if you know this to be different, um, please let me know how to do this. But my understanding is that because many of us use Zoom and we're using Zoom right now, Zoom does not automatically save the cart file that gets created with this presentation. Uh, it will download that content as a separate file. But when it saves it to the cloud and, and redisplays it for people to use, it's going to re-automatically uh, caption that content using its own built-in um, captioning AI. And so there is a rather extensive way you can take the original card transcript and massage it and then reload it into uh, the video. Um, or you can simply take the AI-furnished um, 
content and edit that in post-production. And that's typically what we do at Mainsight when we uh, record our webinars and our meetings. So if you know of a way to get the cart feed to stay in the recording, let me know, because I haven't found out a way to do that. Next slide, please. So the question about what a video conference platform you should use depends on many, many, many different factors and two things you need to consider before you choose. Uh, obviously, if you are going to be presenting something in live format and it needs to have um, high quality captioning, you're going to need to use a video conference platform that has that capability and not all of them do. Uh, some of them will integrate uh, captioning in the form of a subtitle like you can with Zoom. Some of them you can still use, but you have to have another window open. Frequently this is called a, str a stream text window. The stream text is one of the platforms that card transcriptionists use so that the person actually has to have multiple windows open on the screen. So that presents some challenges for some folks. Um, so you need to make your decision about what platform to use based upon the needs of the people in your community that have access issues. If you don't know who that's going to be, you're going to have to assume that some people will need captioning and then you, you should provide it. Now, what we do in our uh, presentations on our webinars for our organization is that we always announce that all of our webinars and meetings are going to be uh, CART uh, captioned and that if somebody needs another kind of accommodation to please let us know. And so somebody may someday say, I need to have American Sign Language and we will have to address that as that request comes in. To this date, we've not had anybody do that, but I think that that day is coming soon. Uh, and that's another, probably a whole other workshop to talk about how you add ASL uh, in, uh, uh, translation to, uh, uh, to a video feed. The other thing you need to consider when you're looking at a video conference platform is the whole playback system. So all these systems, whether you're using um, Microsoft Teams or WebEx or any of those products have some way of recording and playing back the video. You have to ensure that that playback system is also accessible to people with disabilities. And by that, the criteria is that they have it minimally have to be able to start and stop the video uh, and control that, stop and uh, increase and lower the volume and be able to turn captioning on and off. Ideally, it would be nice if they could also change the format of the caption, maybe change the color of the background, perhaps move it around. Those are not required in the, um, the basic standards that are, have been established for this, um, but those would be nice things to have. So consider all those things when you choose your platform. Just don't pick it because it's the best priced one on the market. Next slide, please. So here's the, um, uh, the, the question of the hour of what are the biggest challenges? And I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the four I've written and then um, ask you to start putting some of your own experiences in the chat and we can talk about those. So, um, and this again came up this morning in a meeting. I was meeting with um, Voc Rehab staff, all of whom are deaf. And um, they said, you know, what I, I turned around and said, what's your experience? And everybody agreed. Number one is we have multiple speakers and everybody's talking at the same time. And this is particularly problem in a, a problem in a meeting setting, because I think we've all been in a Zoom meeting at least five times this week already. And you have anywhere from three to 50 people and um, people have things to say and they start talking over each other. Um, and it's a number one problem, particularly if somebody is relying upon captioning to understand what's being said. So something that we do when we have live meetings, because when we have our uh, consortium meetings and our advisory committee meetings, we have people in the room who are uh, hearing impaired and we use a PA system. So we have a little portable public address system with microphones. And we do have a car transcriptionist who is actually coming into the room from a distance. And so we make the rule in the room, we pass the microphone along. So if you have a question, you raise your hand and the microphone gets passed to you and you can ask your question. And nobody else is supposed to talk when somebody else has the microphone. 
So you sort of have to do the same thing in meetings when you are using um, these video conference tools to ensure that only one person is talking at a time. Um, the second biggest challenge is the one I've already mentioned, the names of products, of people, URLs and acronyms are frequently misspelled. So um, you may need to do things like um, you know, simply spell it out for people so that the captionist can get it correctly. Um, and you may need to uh, put it on your slide or in the chat um, pod so that people can see the spelling. Um, the, the third issue that's frequently a problem, and this happens also with a cart, but also is particularly a problem with the live transcription, is the whole issue of punctuation and grammar. Uh, I have seen some of the longest run-on sentences in my life in these uh, captions that get created by the automatic captioning systems. Um, there isn't a period to be seen or a comma to be found. And so frequently when you go back in post-production and edit, you're putting commas in, you're putting periods in, you're capitalizing words. Um, so that's a big problem. If that's what people are seeing initially in the live feed, it's, it's really a problem. Um, the third, uh, fourth button is, um, is accuracy caused by fast talkers. And I see somebody just put in um, something I was thinking, accents are also definitely a problem. Um, about a year ago, we were demonstrating in a live meeting, the Google presentation um, automatic uh, captioning. And uh, there were two people presenting. One was a, a woman from Maine and the other was a gentleman from Virginia who had a bit of a Southern accent. And it, it, it was able to transcribe what she was saying with very, very high degree of accuracy. We were all amazed. And as soon as he started talking, it was like we couldn't understand anything that was being written. For some reason, it just did not like his, his accent. So um, that's, that's one of the things that can happen. So um, that's, that's an issue that you need to be aware of. And that's something that you're less likely to get with a live captioner than you would with an automatic captioner. And then there's the perennial technical snags. Um, we all have had situations where there's a, I'll call it a burp in the system. There's a, the flow of electrons gets in, interrupted in some way, whether it's in my computer, whether it's in my hookup to the internet, whether it's somewhere between here and wherever you are or at your end, there's something that's going to stall or freeze or change the speed. And um, these can have really detrimental effects upon uh, the ability to understand the content. So um, uh, those are the ones I came up with. I'm going to stop for a minute and, and let people type in what they've seen. I just sort of additional issue that has to do with multiple speakers. One thing that uh, if you're going to do, um, again, multiple people in a meeting is to have people announce who they are each time they speak. That helps the car transcriptionist, but it also puts into the permanent record who is speaking. So as people are, go ahead. I was just gonna say, uh, Angela mentioned in Zoom, if you require registration, you can create custom questions and you can add what accommodations do you need to help guide decisions. And then you can go into your scheduled meeting and pull up uh, the participants, uh, participants and their needs. Great, that's a, that's a good, that's a good answer. Um, yeah, we, if you're using the uh, Zoom webinar platform that has that capability of doing registration, we opted to always use our own registration form. We try to harvest a lot of additional information more than we could add in the custom questions. <laughs> we, we ask a lot of questions when we register people. And uh, so, for example, we, we have to get that data for the feds in terms of where people are from and whether they're from a urban setting or a rural setting. So we have a drop down that have all the counties, the 16 counties in Maine in it. So people can just check off the one that they're in um, and that speeds things up. But um, that's actually a good idea. We can ask in that um, setting if they need an accommodation as well. But yeah, it's a good idea. And John, this is Laura. I, I thought of a couple more things while you were talking about some of those challenges, if you don't mind ch me chiming in. Go for it. Um, so just kind of going back to, I know there's, um, I saw a question and answer that came through and someone said that 
they may be unable to do CART. So, you know, what are some the best alternatives? And I did respond and asked, by unable, do you mean, you know, no provider or you can't afford it? And the response was all of the above, but really looking at plan B. And I think it is important to always have that backup plan um, as far as any accommodation that we do. You know, we don't want to have all of our eggs in one basket. We want to make sure that we've got that backup plan B. Um, but a couple things to remember regarding, and you highlighted them a little bit um, when determining the difference between CART or the text translation um, or the AI, is A, you also have to think about the content that's being shared and whether accuracy um, or that concept, which one of those might be okay. And an example I use is when I've worked with students, and sometimes students were fine using text translation for um, a philosophy class or something that did not have a lot of specific vocabulary. However, when it came time to taking biology, for example, they needed to have CART. And so it's taking a look at the purpose and what the content being shared is also part of that decision. Um, a webinar on a very specific topic with lots of vocabulary, you're not gonna wanna use automatic and may not even want text translation. You're gonna want CART. Um, the other is also keeping in mind the reading level of the participants um, when you are, are looking at the platform that you're using. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to share at this point. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think that knowing your knowing your audience is a really a critical part of uh, being being present and being able to deliver this. I'm looking at some of the comments that are being made and um, a couple of good ones. Um, somebody actually offered uh, James offered uh, a solution, perhaps to the people who can't offer cart, and that is the relay conference captioning service. Uh, that might, that's obviously an option. Um, and this actually came up in uh, something I learned yesterday and something that we were doing, but I think I'm going to incorporate institutionalize a little bit more in my planning. Um, Zoom always gives you the option of allowing people to attend the meeting with a link through their computer. And then there's the option of, of attending the audio only using a phone line. They always give you that as an option. And you as the host can turn that on and off, whether you want to use the phone or not. Uh, it would be a good idea to always have the phone as an option because then you can use that phone option to do the, um, the relay service. Um, and somebody pointed out to me that they may, the person may need to use relay to communicate back to you. And if they don't have that phone number, they can't do that. So um, that's, a, that's an option that you'll want to do. Um, somebody talked about it blocks um, it blocks the chat the chat blocks the captioning and vice versa, and that's currently a bug in um, in Zoom. And I know what they're talking about. If you choose under the captioning option in Zoom, you have two things: one is show subtitle, and the other is uh, view full transcript. And if you use the full transcript, it's going to show up on the right side of the screen, often where people have their, their chat feed. Uh, and that can be a problem because then you have to close one or the other to be able to keep both open. Um, another problem that I discovered, which is sort of unrelated to this conversation, uh, that's a bit of a bug with um, Zoom, um, is that if you are a screen reader user, so you're a blind or visually impaired person who uses a screen reader, and you're listening to the content coming from the speaker and you have your chat window open, uh, sometimes your screen reader starts reading what's in the chat and over speaks over the presenter. So that's a challenge, which I think uh, I, there's probably a solution for, but I don't know exactly what it is that's, um, how they're gonna fix that. By the way, uh, if you haven't heard, uh, Zoom is coming out with a big, big update uh, either today or tomorrow. Zoom five, so stay tuned. I don't maybe they'll, maybe they'll have fixed everything by then, but they have been rolling out lots and lots of um, of solutions. 
um, I'm looking at somebody who has, our state has canceled Zoom, uh, we're able to use them. And um, so there are some other platforms that will allow for closed captioning to be uh, injected into them. Um, and you're gonna have to do your homework to find what they are. I think unfortunately the decision about not using Zoom uh, in some cases was based upon a little bit of uh, excitement about um, security that came out Oh, what it was what three weeks ago it seems like a year ago uh, many of those problems have been resolved and my understanding is that with this next version all of those problems have been resolved so perhaps your state will reconsider the other thing that some states have chosen to do is that oh you know we have Microsoft Office we're already paying many 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 dollars for it that has a video conference thing you'll just use that and they're making a decision based upon economics and so I think it's, um, you know, that's a HR question. So if you're a staff person who needs to have captioning and, um, you know, that product is not meeting your needs, I think you need to have the conversation, you know, through the chain of command to um, get that accommodation fixed. And you could, if you're the ATAC program, I think you need to um, make the people at IT in your state know that this is, this accessibility trumps their need for, um, certain things, uh, maybe maybe dollars. So, uh, have that conversation, and I think um, I think it's important to have that conversation. Um, oh, there's somebody named Kathy Adams. I just opened the transcript problem, moved it off to the left, had the chat pod open. There you go. There's a solution. We've we've already come up with an answer. Great. Flip to the John, this is Laura again. Um, just so. Um, I know we're talking about webinars, but just a point of caution um, regarding the use of telephone access mm -hmm. and the fact that it, that is regulated under FCC, so it cannot, it does have to be in different locations. So I had a department here in Wisconsin that wanted to use that, um, even though they were doing a Zoom meeting, some people were in the room. and as a method to avoid paying, they were trying to use relay for the transcription part. So just a word of caution there. Telecom and because it is regulated by the FCC. Because it only the person with a disability can use, is that what you're saying? Well, because she was in the room oh. and she was trying to, they told her to call in using relay. Um, even though she was in the room and they were, some were in the room and some were not in the room and they were using, doing a web-based meeting. And so they were trying to do a workaround of paying for CART. I see. Using Relay. So just a word of caution to remember that um, if you are using any type of Relay, which is telecom, it's separate rooms or separate locations. And then uh, there was uh, uh, Jane um, posted that the Hearing Loss Association of America is petitioning tech industries to provide captioning for free on all platforms as an accessibility accommodation. Um, ARS is now the only available only available on paid platforms of Zoom and Google Hangout Meets. And uh, see the Hearing Loss Association website if you're interested in supporting the petition that they have. Good, good information. Are there any questions in the Q and A that I that I missed? Did we get uh, Angela's about her cart contractor offering in Zoom cart assignment, or they use a secondary app so that the users have to have Zoom open and the and the app? So is one method better or worse? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm chuckling. Um, you know, I think that's going to be one of those case by case basis. Um, I'm trying to visualize how, how, how this is working, but um, you know, I think it's a matter of, of being resourceful and trying to find what works. Um, whether it would work in every situation, I don't know. Um, the nice thing about accessibility now is because there's a recognition that so many things change so rapidly, um, there is a, um, 
a recognition that if you can find another way to do that and it works and it's legal and it's not you're not breaking any other uh, laws, um, then you can certainly use that. But the problem is institutionalizing that across and say that's now the policy for state government or the federal government. So um, you know if it works in a pinch, great. It's the workaround. Um, but I think that you know some of these activities of trying to get more attention to this and more resources put into access, I think, are where we have to go. We have to uh, let people know that their websites are accessible, their videos are accessible, and just keep pounding away at that. Um, John asked a question, John Winter asked a question about uh, translating into a second language like Spanish. And I got, that's, that question came up yesterday in another webinar, and the person who know, knows more than I did didn't know the answer. Um, I know that there is a service, um, there are some services that will do uh, translation. There are, um, there are ways to take, you know, English language and convert it into other language on the fly. Whether that's sufficient enough in a live situation to meet the needs of a person who needs captioning and also speaks a second language or a different language, um, is something I don't know. Um, so uh, that's a good question. I'm going to write that one down and, and research that one because uh, it's come up now twice in two days. And so, uh, so yeah, it would be nice if that was possible. Uh, by the way, a um, little funny story because we have some time. Um, I guess it's now close to two years ago, Microsoft um, delivered the new feature to PowerPoint where you could uh, have the the live captioning. I think most people have seen that by now, and it's now available on all versions of all the uh, Microsoft Office products, or at least the PowerPoint product. And when they first delivered that, I found out about it because they were advertising it as a feature to do just what John is saying. It was a, it was a way that a speaker could go to a, a group and be able to speak in one language and give everybody a little, um, uh, web address that they could then download on their phone and on the fly it would produce in the language and I think there was 60 different languages that Microsoft has in their uh, repertoire it would convert what was being said in the room into one of 60 different languages and I think there was a way to, to do it backwards where you could actually ask questions in Chinese and then the speaker would get it in English or something like that and so they were advertising this new feature and within 24 hours of that announcement, people on the AT community and the accessibility community going, oh, wow, isn't this great? We now have built-in captioning. And about two weeks later, Microsoft came back and said, oh, of course, that's what we thought all along. So they were thinking, yeah, we're going to allow people, we're going to sell this as a feature to the international community or people who speak to you know, large crowds and people with different language and never thought of the access potential for it, but the AT people and the access people quickly saw that as an opportunity. So um, yeah, that's how a lot of things, we learn a lot of things these days are by accident. Oral second language translation, right before you get to CC. Okay, I'm not exactly sure of Angela's question. Um, so, and Stacy's gonna find out about uh, some option where uh, Zoom captioning in Spanish in a second URL underneath the webinar. Oh, okay. So she'll find out and let us know. And maybe we'll share that with everybody. Yeah, we will share And actually, it. John, that, I don't know why I wasn't thinking, um, so thank you, Stacy. Um, you know, you can have you can hire two captionists, and by using a third party like Stream Text or one of those, you know, or ACS or whomever, um, they can have two eight URLs. So if someone needs Spanish with a third party, you can certainly do that, and then they just have to open up a different browser window. And does that new cart transcriptionist has to be somebody that translates it from English to Spanish on the fly? Is that how it works? They would be, yeah. Yeah, it would be essentially someone. And I, um, I'm trying to remember, we used to have a conference that we did live, and I'm trying to remember if we ever had, I don't, I think we only used a sign language interpreter that 
um, signed to the Spanish families. So I don't believe we had two captionists going. Um, but that would be one, the mechanism, that's how that could be done. But the language part, I would still be have to look up that as well. Thanks, Stacey. This is John again. I'm I'm rereading Angela's comment. I'm I think she's commenting to the group saying, uh, if you have somebody who has uh, is a second language user, uh, what would you do in a in a regular live situation? Um, and I'm I'm guessing I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I know that you're required to provide things in other languages in writing if you're going to be a presentation. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, so. Um, yeah, the language is different than disability. Yeah, she says no worries, it'll go up because you're in Texas. <laughs> Everybody speaks multiple languages in Texas. Uh, do, do any more questions? Okay. So we have about 14 minutes left. And you've still got, I do have that one slide on there regarding sign language. Okay, and we do have, there's the, the next slide. If we go to the next slide is the resources. Yep. Um, we are going to uh, send out um, uh, a handout that I created that has um, a number of different, you know, free resources on if you need to go back to the very beginning of how do you do captioning and all the technical requirements, um, that'll be sent to you. And uh, one last thing is, um, if you are very new to captioning and all of a sudden this was dumped on your lap this week and somebody said, come to this webinar, you'll learn everything you need to know, and you're scratching your head, uh, you can hire somebody to do this work for you. More people, there are companies that you can contract with and that will they'll do the whole thing for you. They'll set the whole thing up and, and figure it all out for you. It's just a matter of how much money you have to spend, so. And there is, uh... Phil, Phil in, um, posted, just as a former IT professional, let me continue to encourage some skepticism about Zoom's commitment to security and privacy. And then he lists um, a link to, to a report about confidentiality of Zoom meetings. He's not saying don't use it, but just um, make sure people are aware of what, what the issues are. Yeah, the dark side of the internet. I would agree. It's all there. All right, so if we could jump to the next slide quick. We're just going to briefly touch on this, since this could be its own webinar. Um, but in my office, we do a lot of accommodations regarding the provision of sign language interpreting via webinar. Um, that's our go-to for department meetings, simply because the Office for Deaf and Hard of Hearing is co-located with our office, and that is their primary mode of communication. And so a couple things to remember when you are working and adding in sign language interpretation to a webinar, um, there are differences in how the meeting and the videos are managed, whether it's a meeting versus a webinar. So for an example, in a meeting, it's the onus is really on the participant to pin that video so that then they always are able to see their interpreter. Um, the host can do a spotlight in a meeting and the spotlight will force that to be the primary video shown. Um, however, Sometimes people are joining as participants and they don't have a lot of um, connection to that host. It might be a webinar of, you know, 250 people. And so 
um, in the webinar that hosts can do a spotlight. Um, the other thing is to keep in mind, especially when juggling um, sign language interpreting, is to have co-hosts and panelist options. So, and even with any webinar, it's good to have that team approach. John and I both went, attended the same webinar yesterday and that we each had some takeaways and one of mine was it's a team approach. Um, you always want to have someone to juggle the, the participants and the chat and the questions and answers. Um, again, recognizing and improving instructions ahead of time, the difference between pinning a video versus spotlighting a video. Um, recognizing the impact of screen sharing and providing instructions ahead of time so participants understand if it's a meeting, this is how they have to move things around. If it's a webinar, this is how they have to do that in order to still have access. We um, all need to follow those communication rules of turn taking and pausing. Um, one of the tricks that we do is for our interpreters, we, we have them change their name. So it'll say interpreter Maria, interpreter Susan. So the host and co-host and the participants can find their videos when it's easier. Um, and then empowering the interpreters to interject and say, okay, we have to pause. We have to change interpreters now and letting that host and co-host know that or the speaker know that. Um, you know, always having an alternative method for communication, uh, either text message, the chat, or via Skype or Slack, some other mechanism that if suddenly that interpreter vanishes, the individual who is deaf or hard of hearing has a mechanism to let folks, um, let the host know that they've lost. And then finally, this goes with both captions and sign language interpreting is practice, practice, practice. Um, set up meetings ahead of time with your speakers, with your interpreters, with your captionists to make sure that it's all smooth um, on game day when you're ready to go. And then one last slide are just some resources that I have available to share. Um, one is an overview of, it's created by Tina Childress and Catherine McNally. And so it's got um, an overview with links to your caption apps, um, captioning services, um, and just a wealth of resources for access for deaf, hard of hearing. Um, and then the research, Rehabilitation and Research Center at Gallaudet Deaf Tech um, has a guide on virtual meeting access as well. And Angela, uh mentions that the participants she's talked with prefer the pinning over spotlight um, that you definitely need a facilitator with co-host status um, have you everyone but the interpreters mute um, the video and that helps people find them in large meeting too yes exactly and we um just practiced a um we're gonna have about 600 staff in a webinar um, we're using, it's a meeting, but we're using webinar platform um, tomorrow. And so for that scenario, we determined that the spotlighting is going to allow that better access and more consistent access. But we're also making the staff from the Office for Deaf, Hard of Hearing um, panelists because that gives them more um, control on sizing and even moving the video to a second monitor. Um, and another trick I've used for some individuals is we'll have, if they have access to two devices or two screens, um, they may even go ahead and log into the meeting twice so that they can then enlarge the interpreter um, to whatever they need on that secondary device. And then Krista mentioned uh, when you use an interpreter, pinning the image so it stays visible is another issue. And she's seen a number of difficulties with that. Yep, yep, that's what we were referring to. Yeah, the yep. pinning or the spotlighting. Because if a bit, if it's pinned and someone shares their screen, that pin goes away, depending on which of you they're in. 
And if it's the first time it's happened to a participant and they're not as tech savvy, um, it's a pretty uh, startling experience to suddenly lose your communication access. And Lori in Oregon mentions they have a company that's requesting a referral for somebody to do closed captioning for recorded webinars, videos, um, development of online courses that are ADA compliant. And it would need to be a company that's designated as a disabled veterans business enterprise in California. So if anybody does know of a, a company that is designated, then um, that would be really helpful to Lori Brooks. In the Q&A, I did share the National Court Reporters Association link. So that might be a resource she could dive into. And I think that's all the questions right now. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? It doesn't look like it. Did you have anything that you want to, either one of you um, want to add? Just thanks. Thank everybody for attending today. Yes, thank you very much. And I will tell you that when we send out the, um, when the video uh, recording is available, we'll also send out the um, resource list, the handout that John was talking about. So just watch for that. Thank you everybody for attending and um, we'll look forward to talking with you next time. And, and thanks again to, uh, to Laura and John.